Welcome back, Warriors Tunse Sego Anibuju, Kwe Nin Deluizi Pam Palmeter, and I'm the host of this show, The Warrior Life. This podcast is a show about living the warrior life, a lifestyle that focuses on decolonizing our minds, bodies, and spirits, while at the same time revitalizing our cultures, traditions, laws, practices, and governing structures. It's also about asserting, living, and defending our sovereignty all over Turtle Island. And on this podcast, we've spoken to many Indigenous peoples leading the way as warriors, peacefully defending their lands, protecting water sources, or standing up for the rights of our peoples and advancing self-determination. Our warriors are mothers, fathers, aunties, uncles, and countless cousins, all doing their part as parents, teachers, researchers, spokespeople, authors, and more. Sometimes we are working in our clans, our houses, our communities, our nations, and sometimes we are working with our social justice friends and allies, like those in the Black Lives Matter movement, the human rights movement, and other academics doing really important research, especially around things like anti-racism, decolonization, social justice, and earth justice. A central part of our work has always been around land. The hashtag land back is now being used as the foundation of many actions across Turtle Island and signals the call to go beyond land acknowledgements and make reparations for stolen lands. Today, we get to talk to a research duo who have helped bring to light the important issues of universities that have benefited from expropriated Indigenous lands. Their article is called Land Grab Universities, and it was published in High Country News in March of 2020, and it exposes the system of expropriated Indigenous lands as the foundation of the land-grant university system. I'm really excited to be talking to the authors of this report, Tristan Atone and Robert Lee. Both of them are experts in their field and have extensive accomplishments, which I will let them speak to. Welcome to the Warrior Life Podcast, Tristan and Robert. Thanks for having us. I'm really, really excited. I know um, all of the listeners are just going to be hanging on every word that you're saying because this article was just so profound. So thank you for taking the time. And I'm wondering, Tristan, maybe you'd like to introduce yourself as per your customs, where you're from and your background. Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll keep it simple. My, my name is Tristan Atone. I'm a member of the Kiowa tribe and I'm the editor in chief at the Texas Observer which is a really abbreviated version of many, many, many accomplishments in many, many forums. So we're super lucky to have you here. And how about you, Robert? Hi, I'm Bobby Lee. Uh, I'm a settler originally from New York. Now I live in the UK. I teach American history at the University of Cambridge. Well, that's exciting. And the fact that, you know, you've done so much research on this particular area that we're going to talk about today, which I understand from Tristan is how you two came to be working together. And maybe um, one of you could actually share that story. I think it's important. How did you two come together um, to be working on this research about land dispossession ultimately? Um, We met in 2018 uh, when we were both on fellowships at at Harvard. Tristan was on a journalism fellowship and I was on a postdoctoral fellowship and I was giving a talk uh, on my work related to uh, the land system in the United States, the history of land patenting and the challenge of trying to understand the indigenous origins of U.S. real estate. Um, And I was discussing the Morrill Act uh, and the particular uh, difficulty of uh, reconstructing the entirety of uh, the grants that were made through this 1862 law, totaling about 11 million acres, um, and it was sort of a uh, it was it was half informational and half uh, begging for help because of the uh, the size and scope of uh, of trying to of trying to sort of un- untie untie this knot. Um, and fortunately, Tristan was in the audience. And Tristan, I mean, you must have been attracted to this just from the investigative aspect of it. 
Well, yeah, I, for, from my perspective, being a journalist, what, what, what Bobby was doing was just good old fashioned investigative journalism. Um, obviously, as a historian, it's sort of operating in a different time period. But I also think uh, when it comes to story and investigations, especially in indigenous communities, uh, the, the past is really always present. Um, and I, I think sort of keeping that in mind made the work that Bobby was doing particularly exciting to look at, uh, especially because even at the time, uh, Bobby did know that th these funds were still on the books of a lot of universities. And it was only in, even in subsequent investigations and research that we found that so many universities were still profiting off of this land too. So what, I think what Bobby's been able to do is, is draw a direct connection between this 1862 Act and present operating of these universities, uh, which bring up a lot of really big questions about, uh, about what you do with this information um, and how you can harness this information, at least in, in the interest of justice and equity on some level at universities, be it uh, free tuition for Native students or even land returns. Uh, we've, seen a, we've seen a wide gamut of uh, responses to the work, but um, that is what attracted me because I think there's a lot of applications to the work that Bobby's doing. Well, I think that's the other thing that really makes it stand out. You don't know, is this like an article, a magazine article? Is this an academic paper? Is this an expose? You know, how to actually, uh, is it a report? How to actually categorize it? And I think what is one of the things that's unique about it is that you do come from it with two different lens. You know, you've got um, an Indigenous person, a settler, you've got a historian and a journalist, and all of the different experiences and the focus that you put on it, you could, that really comes out in the article. Like, I think this is an incredible piece of work. I mean, it's just really speaks to where we are as Indigenous peoples right now and our focus on land. Um, and, I'm, and I'm wondering, maybe you could share some of the highlights of this article for the people who haven't read it already. Before I jump into the highlights, I, I, I'm, I'm uh, glad you picked up on this, and I just want to say that it's uh, it's even more than it's even more than a, a work of history and a work of journalism. It's also a photo essay. Uh, it is a work in digital humanities. It's a work of cartography. So it was uh, uh, Tristan and I started this off, but then the collaboration grew to include a cartographer, a historian. Uh, uh, people working in digital uh, data journalism, uh, coder, uh, and you can see all these sort of contributions to the project, which makes it, um, on the one hand, all of these different modes of communicating um, and uh, fit comfortably uh, amongst, uh, uh, or, or it doesn't fit comfortably among all of them. Um, and so it's sort of like, is it, is it everything or is it nothing? It's, it's, a, difficult, uh, it's a difficult work to categorize. Um, but to give the, uh, the sort of the brief overview of what's in the article, um, just to sort of start at the beginning and to explain to listeners what the Morrill Act is. Uh, the Morrill Act of 1862 is one of thousands of land laws that the United States passes in the long 19th century uh, to redistribute the public domain of the United States. And the public domain of the United States is comprised of land that has been expropriated from hundreds of indigenous nations through uh, treaties that are ratified or not, um, outright seizures of territory. Um, and the Morrill Act is one of the better known of these laws. It's passed in 1862 in a year when there are three sort of landmark uh, laws, uh, the Homestead Act of 1862, the Pacific Railway Act, uh, which uh, which supported the development of uh, the transcontinental railroads. The Homestead Act is even larger in terms of what it gives out uh, to individuals who want to set up farms. Um, and of these sort of big three in 1862, the, the Morrill Act is actually the, the smallest one. It gives out about 11 million acres uh, to states to sell off to raise endowments for universities of their of their choice. Um, the idea behind this law was that it was supposed to democratize higher education in the United States. And this is what you see when you uh, 
uh, when you uh, go to land grant universities, you hear speeches at anniversaries, you see statues of Abraham Lincoln, uh, you walk through Morrill Halls, uh, named after Justin Morrill, the senator who was the who was the sponsor of the of the bill. Um, but what you don't see is the, the flip side of the story, where this land came from. So our analysis was of the Morrill Act, not as a donation from the United States, uh, but as a wealth transfer from indigenous nations uh, to, to uh, states and universities for capital uh, to, to support uh, education. So what we did was we identified all of the land that was distributed through the Morrill Act. So if you're familiar with a, a map of the United States, and if you imagine uh, the states of Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut, um, and you lop off Cape Cod, so you have a little rectangle, that's about the size of the amount of land that was distributed through the Morrill Act. And it's broken up into about 80,000 uh, different pieces. Um, but those pieces are scattered across uh, 24 states of the United States. And we had to find out where each one of those pieces were and identify who the original uh, indigenous landowners or caretakers were so we could uh, tie the university endowments that were built from this land to the nations that supplied it um, to the United States through these various uh, coercive treaties. It's absolutely incredible. I mean, Tristan, I'm sure nothing surprises you anymore about the whole colonization project and, you know, Canada or the U.S., but I mean, the sheer extent of the land theft, I mean, 10 million acres? Like, did any of this surprise you at all? Uh, I, I mean, I guess no. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I think what really surprised me was the the amount of information to actually make those connections. Um, I, we've talked about this before and that this sort of idea that, you know, the United States or its many institutions are funded by uh, expropriated indigenous land. You know, I, I don't, those are obviously not sort of new concepts in any way whatsoever, but um, the ability to start really tying some pretty hard data to it. Uh, I think that's where it was really exciting to be able to do this and, and essentially find the receipts for every acre that was going to every university, which is a, a much, I think, a much different sort of animal than this sort of saying that universities were funded by stolen indigenous land, which is true, but also being able to put exact dollars, locations, et cetera, onto those uh, makes it very different. So I guess the only thing that is still surprising me about this story uh, are the numbers of universities that refuse to even look at the information. I shouldn't be surprised, but uh, I, I guess I still sort of am. Um, there, as Bobby said, so many of these institutions really celebrate their uh, moral act origins and the fact that we can provide information that almost no university has whatsoever and it is, uh, in fact, ignored is, is definitely sort of an issue uh, that, that continues to sort of make me scratch my head. Well, I think that's a really important point that you raise because this isn't just, you know, a political piece or an op-ed in some newspaper, you know, saying, um, you know, universities are based on all of this land theft, um, you know, generalized statements. This is literally as if you were preparing for court. You literally have the receipts. You have the evidence. You have this. I mean, I can't even imagine how long or how much work it took you both um, and everybody else involved in it to actually do this work, but to literally track down the proof for each of these things. I mean, what a monumental task. How do you even start something like that? Well, there's a... There's a uh a sort of secret recipe, um, a big leg up uh, that we had in terms of um, the digitization of, uh, of land patent material by the Bureau of Land Management. Really over the past 25 years, they have been digitizing um, uh, information on, on millions of land patents over the past uh, over the past generation, not in order to facilitate this type of research. Um, they put it out in order to uh, make it easier for individuals who need to look up the history of their property for various legal reasons. 
Um, and they put out this material so people don't have to go into the physical archives uh, and laboriously pull out each item. Um, so this resource has um, tens of thousands of these patents. So the big sort of starting point was figuring out how to uh, rip that data out and repurpose it to a project like this. Um, and then the next step was to figure out where we were at um, in terms of completeness and how we could fill in the holes with more traditional uh, archival research. So it was like putting together a big uh, puzzle, but you don't know how many pieces there they are, and they're not in one box. They're in a bunch of different drawers in different places. There's a whole bunch in this digital drawer that's online, and then there's a there's some at a university archive, and there's some in a state archive, and there's a whole bunch in the National Archives in Washington, D.C., um, and just breaking down the constituent parts and putting it all back together um, so you could... Uh, so you could get a picture of the of the whole. And if you look at uh, if you if you read the piece, one of the first items in there is the map that Margaret Pierce, uh, the cartographer on the project, uh, put together that shows just the national footprint across, you know, the continent wide footprint uh, of the Morrill Act. Um, and that's what the that, you know, we didn't know what that was going to look like until it was all until all those pieces were, were pulled together from those various from those various uh, repositories. Yeah, I, I mean, at one point when we were going through our like fact check process, which was a really heavy process for us to, to do, uh, you know, we, we had to dispatch uh, our photographer, Kaylin Goodluck, to uh, you know Bureau of Land Management office up the road and uh, from him in New Mexico just to get the rest of these documents. So he's, you know, he's in there doing FaceTime with with Bobby trying to figure out which are the right documents to pull out so we can get the plug that hole in the New Mexico data set. Uh, and then we're going through and entering them into the computer. Uh, yeah, there is quite a bit of labor that goes into it. but. Um, one of the aims of the project was to make sure all of that data is available to everybody. So, so in theory, nobody ever has to do this again. It's now all available for download. Uh, you can access it if you're not a heavy data user through uh, our interactive maps on LandGrabU, uh, or you can go to our GitHub repository and just pull all of the information down, which is what we're seeing a lot of institutions starting to do to examine that. Um, and this also really just helps keep us I think accountable to readers and researchers as well is that our, our work is it can be replicated uh, almost no matter how you slice it, and uh, we wanted to make sure that all of that was available for people to double check. So and even use. oh, go ahead. Oh yeah, double check and use. <laughs> well, you know, even beyond the the research and the publication that has come out, it's a real public service that it's all open access, that it's there for people to see, to verify, to use themselves, which is a real move away from, you know, the way we used to work in the past, where information was kind of like monetized in the sense that, you know, they, they were only in academic journals that you had to be a member of to get, or you could only access it through a consultant by paying for services. But this is not only a monumental piece of work, uh, it's also a monumental public service that you've provided by making it open access. Was this something that you knew right away, right at the beginning of the project, that this was something that you wanted to do? Yeah, I think this is something we discussed very early in the process. And I, I think, um, you know, on the journalism side, uh, sharing your data and information, I, I think, is just the future of good journalism. Uh, this idea that we need to, as you said, kind of keep everything to ourselves, keep it locked down so nobody else can see it, uh, I, I, I think it's just horribly dangerous and horribly detrimental to our industry to do that. Uh, th this idea of competition, um, you know, through journalism, just, it feels very like, it feels very like capitalism driven, colonial driven. It feels like things that aren't really in the best interest of the public quite often. And I think that 
being able to make sure that folks can not only check it, but also be able to add to it is really important. And I'll let Bobby talk a little bit about that, about uh, the hopes in terms of not only making it public, but what people could actually do with it. Yeah, I mean, the open source, uh, making it open source was always, always the plan. Um, there's a way in, in, in terms of the type of scholarship this is, uh, for me as a historian, I see the publication of the data also as sort of like the footnotes for the piece. This is how people can check to see that what we're saying is true, that these are the parcels. You can go through the data and you can reconstruct exactly what we did uh, to put the database together. Um, so you can check our work. Um, there's also a, in terms of this being a sort of experiment in, in journalism and scholarship, um, there is there was a way in which we could have, you know, two and a half years ago, put out a story on one university, pulled together their data and put it out. Um, but the danger in doing that um, in terms of uh, the sort of the academic marketplace that I'm in is that people then might be uh, less inclined to do other uh, other iterations of it uh, because it doesn't have uh, it doesn't have a sort of uh, newness to it. So putting it all together and putting it out all at once um, has the impact in terms of the coverage of the entire entire moral act, um, but also sets up other researchers, journalism, uh, journalists to do um, new work based on our uh, based on our database, using it as a sort of springboard. So they're not repeating what we did. They don't have to. Uh, they don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, they can immediately take it in different directions and use what we did as as a base uh, to instead of instead of sort of iterate um, across other universities to sort of branch outward and and look into different aspects of the history of the moral act because even in terms of the scope of what what we put together here there's a tremendous amount that we still just don't know about how uh, about how this wealth transfer operated um, and what we're hoping is that other journalists, other other scholars, uh, will pick up the ball and run with this in various directions to uncover that broader history. Um, so it's not just our team working on this, but various teams at, at, at various places who have who have an interest in this material um, and providing the tools to uh, to realize uh, those various projects. Sort of like a, a repository or database that people can add to to kind of keep building on the work that you've done. Yeah, I, I, we hope so. I mean, we've seen uh, like the Eye on Ohio, which is an investigative news outlet in Ohio, uh, be able to use this data to look at uh, Ohio State's lands and who they benefited from. Uh, we saw a really great piece come out of Scallywag Magazine, which is a southern magazine here in the U.S. that took the data to look at uh, South Carolina states and then build on top of that, or wait, North Carolina. North, they took North the Carolina. Data, yeah, they took the data from North Carolina uh, in order to inform their reporting, but then pushed even further into areas that we hadn't even been able to touch uh, by looking at other lands that the state had benefited from uh, outside of the Morrill Act, too. Um, you know, th we've just seen dozens of pieces here now uh, that, that really have been able to take the information and just run with it and really open even our eyes to uh, new areas that, that are able to be explored and uh, really investigated a lot more. And, uh, I think the other big thing that we're seeing is university pickup, too. Uh, university of California and Cornell University have all launched projects to examine this data in, uh, you know, much, much more closely. So we're excited to see sort of where they're going with those, too. Um, and we're just, yeah, we're just hoping to see where else it ends up and how people are thinking about it, because there's just, as Bobby said, a ton of things we don't know, things that we're not thinking about, and it's really exciting to see other folks uh, lean into that space. Well, one of the things I wanted to do was just read a little tiny segment from your article for listeners and get your feedback, uh, the both of you, on you know what the implications are. So, like one of my pet peeves are um, 
the reliance on land acknowledgements without taking further, you know, reparations, especially around land. So I'm just going to read this tiny uh, section and get your response. So it says, chances are you have heard land acknowledgements recited at many of these universities, formal statements that recognize the indigenous peoples who formerly possessed the lands those colleges now stand on. What many of these statements miss is that land-grant universities were built not just on Indigenous land, but with Indigenous land. It's a common misconception, for instance, that the Morrill Act grants were only used for campuses. In fact, the grants were as big or bigger than major cities and were often located hundreds or even thousands of miles away from their beneficiaries. I mean, to me, that section was just, I mean, I learned something from this too, because I often think about, you know, land grants being specifically for the land that the campus sits on. And I'm wondering, you know, if, if both of you can expand on that a little more, just how prevalent was it that the lands were used, um, you know, like you said, miles or thousands of miles away from these campuses? Yeah, in terms of the in terms of the Morrill Act, it was seldom the case that the land on which the universities were built uh, came were were selected through the Morrill Act. They usually are are disconnected completely. In the uh, in terms of uh, the this story's interaction with uh, the sort of history of land acknowledgements, what we were adding in here is this, this idea as we put it in the, in the story that land grant universities are built with indigenous land, not just on indigenous land. Um, we've, all, we've all heard uh, land acknowledgements for the past, uh, I don't know, 10, 15 years or so. Um, and they 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 acknowledge a, a connection, but not off not an implication uh, that has contemporary resonance for what's going on uh, at the universities themselves and how they came to be. Um, this story was showing how how land was not just uh, incidental to what universities are today; it's essential uh, to explaining uh, their uh, their 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 growth and prosperity over the past 150 years since something like the Morrill Act. And I, I think to your point of the land acknowledgement, so uh, maybe falling flat, especially at land grant universities at this point. I think that the information is is now at least being looked at to sort of improve on those. Uh, I, I'm not sure if that actually gets to anything in terms of the land acknowledgement beyond being more accurate, but not actually offering any uh, yeah, reparations or re land returns or any actionable items for that matter. But uh, beyond that, even with our follow-up stories in, in this area is looking at the 16 universities uh, that still have land. I mean, we, we found that these 16 universities still have uh, nearly half a million acres uh, granted through the Morrill Act that they're still profiting off of. And that one last year, fiscal year 2019, we found that it was $8.7 million in revenue that these universities pulled in. And that's just one year. We're not even, we, nobody has the information on what it looks like for the last 50 to 100 years about what revenue those lands have produced. So those land acknowledgments, uh, I think, are, are definitely falling short because that land is still at play and that land is still producing revenue for uh, universities. And uh, arguably, indigenous students uh, are, are not seeing any benefit from that. Well, and I think that's one of the ways, the many ways in which your research brings history into the present. Oftentimes, you know, when you're talking about reconciliation or apologies or acknowledgements, it's, you know, we're sorry this bad thing happened in the past, you know, let's move forward. Uh, but in fact, to know that universities are still uh, benefiting from this dispossession and obviously not benefiting the impacted Indigenous groups is something that's today. 
So it's not even like, oh, that's something an ancestor did. That's today. That's the current reality um, and why people are talking about doing more than just acknowledging the land. But what role, I mean, in all of this, it must have come to mind, you know, thinking about once, once all of this is exposed, and I mean, this is significant, what role do you think that these institutions have in, first and foremost, acknowledging the entirety of the situation, and then uh, what should they be doing about it? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think at the sort of bare minimum that it, it is incumbent on universities to acknowledge their histories, uh, a failure to, to, to update even their language about the Moral Act and how it impacted their university and the communities that that act impacted um, is, is by every definition of it, an injustice. How folks actually respond to it, though, I, I think is definitely different university to university. I, I think that these are hopefully long conversations that are beginning now in which students, staff, and faculty are, are looking at this data, thinking about it, what, what it means to them. Um, and then hopefully they're speaking with uh, other indigenous communities and tribal nations to talk about what uh, those reparations can actually look like. Um, I'm using the word reparations, although it's not exactly the right uh, term to be using here. I, I think these are different decisions in every state and every community uh, that, that range everything from, uh, as I mentioned before, free tuition to return of actual lands. Uh, but, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's definitely a spectrum there. Mm -hmm. And I think the first step after acknowledging, uh, the second step is to start having those conversations uh, with impacted communities. Yeah, I look at these as a, a, a debt that needs to be repaid, and acknowledgments are a good first step. They wouldn't be a good uh, a good last step. Um, so we need to think about the sort of spectrum of possibilities for how to react uh, to the uh, growing awareness that these that these um, Debts exist, and that they can be that they can be acted upon. Um, as a as a as a teacher, I would be interested in seeing um, courses built around this material, where universities can look into it more in a similar way that universities have looked into their histories with uh, slavery uh, and their connections to profiting from the transatlantic slave trade. Um, I'd like to see, and we're already seeing some, some of this uh, sort of committees at universities trying to think about how to investigate this and trying to start to ask questions, as some universities have been. I mean, the uh, South Dakota State University with their uh, Wikini initiative is at the vanguard uh, of rethinking the history and implications of the Morrill Act, redirecting funds um, toward the benefit of their indigenous student population. Um, thinking about ways that faculty lines can be opened, scholarships can be created, um, and taking it all the way to the possibilities for land return, uh, which is entirely within, uh, uh, we were recently um, at a discussion virtually um, at UC Berkeley, and I was, uh, frankly, I, I was astonished by the sort of, uh, the possibilities for thinking about what it could look like to create new partnerships for the return of land, uh, the management um, arrangements for the access of land, uh, access to uh, to indigenous communities in California. Um, yeah, the, I think the, the, the possibilities are there. Uh, they just need to be talked about and, uh, and thought about as something that uh, is uh, not just uh, worth acting on, but something that can be acted on. That's the whole thing. It's coming to the table, having discussions about this. And, you know, like you said, the whole spectrum of what's possible. I can't even imagine what you were thinking right at the penultimate moment before, you know, you hit publish on this article, if you knew what the response would be. I mean, I know in, you know, Indian country, all over native Twitter, I mean, it made the rounds over and over and over again. You saw it on Facebook and Instagram. And I mean, th this article was being talked about in panels and, you know, in our communities and, um, it was it was very very significant. What kind of response have you seen from you know the 
American public, the academic community, maybe universities, um, tribes on the ground? Like, is have you have you had a consistent kind of you know is there a trend in the the response to this or have you been surprised by any of the response or lack thereof in terms of response from institutions that those seem to be driven by students staff and faculty uh, so for instance university of california as bobby mentioned Cornell university we saw at uh, uh, university of florida that student senate had demanded the school form a working group to look at this information and data and address indigenous land expropriation. Uh, we've also seen, a, a, again, a ton of sort of pickup on the journalism end. We've been able to use this data, for instance, to do sort of a big correction even at the, the New York Times with uh, their ongoing uh, op-ed series looking at a new America, uh, quote unquote, and their opening, their opening op-ed looked at how great the Moral Act was and how it founded U.S. universities, which gave us an opportunity to sort of step up and um, write an op-ed with them to to correct that narrative and correct that history. Um, so we're we're seeing those 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 pickups, and and again, I think on, on in my mind these are long conversations that are likely going to take a few years. Um, but I am surprised, I guess, at the number of places that have picked it up because this this published right at the at the very first height of COVID um, hitting the U.S. and and just really uh, you know hitting the rest of the world. So when you ask what we were concerned about in publishing, I think we had a lot of concerns in terms of like did we fact did did we miss anything? Did we dot all the I's? Did we cross all the T's? But also the conversation of well, is anybody going to read this because <laughs> There was no other story in media at the time except COVID. Uh, every, there, there was almost no other story. It was the one story the entire world was telling. So we were worried we were gonna get lost. Uh, the, the fact that it's managed to sort of cut through that and start generating conversation, I, I think is just really exciting and really heartening to see that uh, there, there seems to be such a hunger for uh, this kind of reporting and this kind of data. You know, back in March, we were really biting our nails, not knowing what was going to happen. We had a lot of, as we were uh, getting ready for the rollout of the story, uh, there were people that were interested in, in promoting it, uh, and they just got all, you know, pulled away by this global, this glo global event, the uh, pandemic. Um, but it was really heartening to see that the most, uh, the most um, excited and enthusiastic response was, as, as you were saying, um, in this social media uh, space where it was from the ground up, where people were, uh, people were at home, stuck at home, and they were, they were excited to read it, maybe happy to have a uh, distraction. Um, I think it's also interacted in important ways with the emerging discussions of uh, social justice that have been um, exposed over the summer, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, the protests in the wake of George Floyd's murder in Minnesota. Um, there's really been this discussion about okay, in a in a time of in a time of crisis, um, who benefits and and who loses. Um, and I think some people have been attracted to the story to think about uh, you know the the world that we live in and the possibilities for change. That's certainly the context I think in which the the New York Times uh, became became interested in it. Um, but yeah, the reaction has really been from the from the ground up, um, and we're seeing this sort of slow uh, slow growing interest. And I think that's where uh, uh, where it has a, a chance to have this long term benefit is where it isn't just a sort of story of the month. Um, this is a resource that can live on. People will be able to access it. People can go to the website. Um, it's really exciting to hear that people are teaching with it or reading it in reading groups long after uh, it's come out. And we hope that continues to be the continues to be the case. Oh yeah, well, think about when it came out in you know March. Aside from it 
being COVID, um, it's also the end of a university term in many cases, especially here in Canada, you know, everything is, you know, wrapping up. So here now we're in the fall and after everything that happened, especially here in Canada. So right before COVID, Canada was literally shut down with native protests and um, peaceful occupations all across the country in defense of our lands, you know, trying to uphold our lands, supporting the Wet'suwet'en peoples. And, you know, we went into COVID, that was only a brief pause. And then we were, you know, in solidarity protests with Black Lives Matter and against police brutality and the killings of Black and Indigenous peoples. And now we're, we're almost right back to where we were. We have, you know, Haudenosaunee at 1492 land back lane that's you know in six nations territory about the haldeman track that was wrongfully uh taken and they're defending their lands you've got Mi'kma'ki defending their lands and resources Wet'suwet'en you know Shoquetmik like there's so many instances where we're still fully engaged in this issue that centers around land and now we're at you know in this critical university college teaching moment where this is like a prime resource because even though you didn't do the expose of what happened in Canada, we know that what happened in the U S and what happened in Canada, very strong parallels in terms of, you know, all of the genocidal laws and policies that happened around um, colonization. You know, it could be residential, you guys called it boarding schools, you know, forced sterilizations, uh, you know, all of the wrongs that were committed. And one of the biggest one was land thefts, or treaties that were negotiated under, you know, duress, violence, threats, you know, all of those kinds of things. And so the land issue is, is you know, it takes place in different ways. The dispossessions take place in different ways, but in very similar ways. So the one thing I was telling Tristan before we started was, you know, when I saw this title, I went through it, read it as fast as I could to see, did they also do Canada? <laughs> and so, you know, I'm like, wow, maybe there could be a future research partnership with, you know, academics and historians and journalists and cartographers and all of those people here in Canada to do the exact same thing. Because this is really about all of the untold stories of colonization. We think we know the history, but there's, we know far less than is actually still hidden. And I think you two have done some very profound work with all of the other people that you worked with. And you've done a huge public service and not just to the United States. This has very direct relevance and impact in Canada. And I would argue probably in many other territories that have Indigenous populations that had land stolen by different, you know, colonial governments. So, I mean, Honestly, thank you for this work that you've done. And, you know, I'll do my best to try to amplify it. It's going to be a number one teaching tool for me. But is there anything else that podcast listeners who come from a variety of backgrounds, Indigenous and non-Indigenous academics, you know, um, non-academics, people working in all different fields, is there anything else that we can do to help raise public awareness about this huge issue? I mean, thank you for those kind words. I, I think uh, the more people that are reading it, interacting with it, uh, sharing it, and really trying to build uh, anything from coursework to reporting work around it um, is really what I, I'd love to see. Uh, you know, the fact that there this was spread out over 80,000 parcels, we've, we've often said that means there are 80,000 stories there. And we were able to just barely even scratch the surface because we needed the time to sort of set up the entire, um, the entire issue and explain it and, and report it out. But there are so many ways that you can dig into it. Uh, as Bobby said, sending out even Kaylin to take photos, you know, sort of puts a personality and puts a face to a, a piece of land. And I, I think there's a... You know, Kayla did a really beautiful job with those photos and I, I think speaks to the kind of work that folks can be doing on the ground and, uh, you know, exploring these parcels a lot more. But to your point of, of having some international impact, you know, if we had that magic wand to sort of wave and, and do this all over again, I, I think we would be looking at this in, in an international context as well, is that, um, you know, what is the situation uh, with... The, the entanglement between institutions and land grabs in Canada and uh, New Zealand and Australia. We, we know that there are similar 
programs and similar situations with those institutions in, in those other countries that have experienced colonialism. And if I could, that's what I would do is to make this a, a massive international project. And maybe that's still a possibility in the future. Uh, but um, drawing all of those conclusions and drawing on all of those threads, I think, really help to make all of us uh, just see how connected we are and really be able to find each other, I think, even through story and, uh, and data like this. I mean, I just, I, settler colonialism is a, is a global phenomenon and the, the creation of state institutions out of indigenous land is a global phenomenon. Uh, so it would be surprising if you didn't find these uh, same processes at work um, in, in, in Canada, all over the Anglo world and in, in Africa, um, in Southeast Asia. You're gonna find this, uh, you're gonna find this everywhere. Um, in terms of things that people can do, yeah, I mean, you can, uh, you can read it, you can check out uh, the landgrabu.org website and try and find some place you know, some place you've been, you know, you can zoom all the way in and you can, you can look at the, you can look at the parcels at the sort of satellite view um, and you can see uh, what connections you have or people you know um, have uh, to, the, to these lands and these spaces. Um, and let people know what you found um, on on so on social media or or elsewhere. You know that's a really good addition to make because you know as indigenous peoples or academics, when governments or municipalities or institutions reach out and they want to know more, they want to engage in reconciliation. Oftentimes, they come with this very generic, you know, kind of indigenous platform. And we always say, start local. I mean, the, the very first people you should be talking to and engaging with and acknowledging and including in your courses and your history is your local. For I mean, here in Canada, we call them First Nations. I mean, in the U.S., it could be your local, you know, tribal government or uh, tribal nation. Um, it, but start local and you've given us an incredible resource especially in the u.s to be able to do that to say okay where am i who am i accountable to and what it, what is it that i need to acknowledge and i mean this is pretty significant i mean you've basically done the work for universities <laughs> to be able to do that if they didn't know already so um thank thank you both for that i'm i'm so excited like i just keep reading this article um, with new eyes, with new ideas, um, and hopefully there's lots of other people out there who will now, if they haven't already, read it, check out the website, check out all the additional resources and see where maybe they can plug in their research or grants. I mean, there's just so many opportunities, right? We're not all independent billionaires, but there's people who get research funds and, and you know money for projects and they need project ideas what a great project to expand it into Canada, you know, internationally and or add to what you've already done. So I can't thank you both enough for the work and all the people that are with you, of course, um, for coming on the podcast to share the process and the thought, you know, all of the, you know, findings and what we can do with these findings and the importance of the work with listeners because they're always looking for ways in which they can help and you know to to really your messages around focusing on talking about this and sitting down and having a conversation and how do we move forward on all of these things i think is the most important that we take education out of the education just for informational purposes realm and put it into the education for action and justice realm and i think the work that you've done is is basically all of the evidence and the facts and the material we need to really move forward on um, on education for action and taking action and and everybody uh, who benefits from it um, to take action for it and thank you so much um, we'll do what we can to promote it and um, I hope we can have you back again when your project has expanded and you have more materials that you can share with us Sure, anytime. We really appreciate the uh, invitation and, and thank you again for the kind words. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. No, it's, it's fantastic. I learned so much just talking to you both. And thank you all to our podcast listeners for tuning in to the Warrior Life podcast. 
I hope that you will be part of reading the article, checking out the website, sharing it, helping to educate others, maybe engaging in projects, having these important conversations, and really working our way towards justice um, for all of the things that happen, and in, in particular, centering around land. Um, the more you can share that with all of your friends, families, communities, and social justice allies, the better. Um, and, it's, and it's really important now more than ever that we all come together to help ensure justice for all people. So after listening to the episode, listen to it again, share it, take notes, and put this education into action. Until next time, keep living a warrior life. Walaliog.